afternoon on the East Coast, lunchtime. Uh, good morning on the West Coast, nine o'clock. Thank you for joining us for the fourth annual Awake Together uh, Patient Summit here for the American Sleep Apnea Association. Um, we are really excited today to have this panel um, talk about children in sleep apnea and the importance of early interventions uh, with children. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a minute to introduce everybody. Uh, today with us, we have Dr. Sarah Honecker. Uh, she is the Assistant Professor of Pediatrics, Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, Director, Behavioral Sleep Medicine at Riley Hospital for Children. Uh, and we also have Michelle Karen here. She is an OSA patient, and she um, had um, OSA and pediatric apnea probably uh, since maybe she was about eight years old, and she's going to speak about how that um, journey was for her and her family. And we have Margarita Aguilar here with us. She has a son who is five years old who has been using a CPAP machine and diagnosed with um, obstructive sleep apnea. So we're really excited to have these women here with us today to, to share their stories and hopefully really make a difference in the lives of, uh, of children as they, you know, grow and progress into adults. Um, just a couple of quick um, housekeeping things. We have Teresa here who works with the ASA and one of my team members. She's not on video, but she's here to answer uh, and help us with the Q&A. So um, for those in the audience, we're not going to be using the chat. You, you're welcome to use the chat to talk to one another, but we're not going to be monitoring that. Please put your questions and comments and so forth in the Q&A, and Teresa's going to monitor that, and uh, when appropriate, bring up your question, and uh, we'll also have a Q&A at the end of, of the session as well. So um, let's kick it off with Michelle. Michelle, why don't you talk to the audience here and tell us a little bit about, you know, your journey with OSA, um, you know, from your childhood until, until now. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Karen, and I'm currently 29 years old, and I was diagnosed with sleep apnea when I was 23 years old, but I believe that I have had sleep apnea since, again, I was around eight years old. That is when my snoring was very intense and I had my tonsils and adenoids removed. Uh, some of the other symptoms that persisted were, uh, you know, being sick all the time, even after the tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy um, with colds and with sinus infections. I was also uh, very fatigued as a child and as a teenager and an adult. <laughs> um, it was definitely the type of fatigue that didn't necessarily stand out because I was also an athlete. Um, I swam competitively for 13 years, including into college. So uh, it just, it seemed like I was just a tired athlete at, you know, back then. I also uh, had a lot of anxiety surrounding sleep. And I feel like this is the biggest one that we missed uh, because we didn't connect the snoring and the frequently becoming sick with the anxiety, which only occurred at night. Um, I would feel a lot of anxiety and snowballed panic attacks because of my fear of not falling asleep and not having enough sleep because that would cause me to go from just fatigued during the day to having like a really hard time functioning, being able to go to school, being able to work out and go to my practices and perform while it's with me. So that was uh, a big one for me. And when I was 23 years old, I was done with swimming. I had graduated from college and I put on a little bit of weight and that exacerbated all my symptoms to the point where it was dangerous for me to be a functioning adult driving to and from work. Uh, that was, you know, just everything I was doing. It was not safe and it was not healthy. And I was very depressed about it. So um, I finally went in and got a sleep study and I could not believe that my uh, AHI was 20 at the time. I, I, I never gasped when I snored. I never woke up feeling like I couldn't breathe. So that just, I, I did the sleep apnea um, I, I did the sleep study because I thought I had nowhere else to turn but I didn't actually think that I had sleep apnea. So, uh, that's kind of my story in a nutshell up to age 23. And I'm very grateful that I did have my diagnosis young because 
although I, it could have been younger, <laughs> it's still being at 23 was fairly young. And you uh, did try um, uh, treating with a CPAP machine, but yes. then talk just a little bit about that, about what sure. your therapy is now. Yes. So I tried a CPAP machine and a dental or oral appliance, and neither worked very well for me. So when I was uh, 28 years old, or excuse me, 27 years old, I had my surgery uh, for Inspire. It's a device um, that provides a uh, stimulation for uh, the hypoglossal nerve, which opens up my airway at night. Yeah, it tries to go the implant. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, later on in the uh, summit, actually tomorrow, uh, Teresa is going to be hosting a webinar talking about uh, insomnia, uh, sleep apnea, or fatigue. And mm -hmm. and and it, it is interesting that you're even talking about that here, about having all of that anxiety about going to sleep and worry about the next day and, and, you know, am I going to be, am I going to feel good? Am I going to, you know, mm -hmm. all that as a teenager, as a young adult, you know, having all of that weigh on you every night, it, it, you know, it creates another problem, like you're saying, where you're just, you know, not only are you physically having OSA, but now you're having all of these other conditions, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, weigh on you to, to create the insomnia or, or anxiety. That's, that's a lot. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And have you found that you, you've been better now that you, with that part of it since, since your treatment? Has that gotten better? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, a lot of the anxiety and depression has definitely decreased and is more manageable. I feel much more able to function and staying at a healthy weight is a lot easier now. Yeah, that's good. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you later. I'm going to let okay. um, Margarita go ahead and talk about her story because she is at the beginning part of your journey with, with her son. Uh, so thanks, Margarita, for sharing your story. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so my name is Margarita. My son is uh, Rohan. He's five years old now. And um, he was diagnosed with uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea at about... Uh, two years old, but he definitely had it before. The symptoms that started, and that's my son right now outside. Um, the symptoms that started was that um, at exactly one year old, he started having these uh, breath holding spells. And then uh, when he got mad, he would just stop um, breathing for a minute and sometimes he passed out. And uh, then he used to have like recurrent, um, um, I am so sorry that exactly the right time, right? Um, if you just excuse me for a minute. Yes, go ahead. We'll go back. <laughs> we all remember uh, when everyone started on uh, Zoom with the uh, with the pandemic, the gentleman that was on the BBC, remember, and he was talking and then the kids kind of came in the background. So we're, we're, we're well aware of that. Yeah. And we're, you know, I'm sure a lot of us here are parents and or caregivers for, for young ones. So <laughs> no worries, no worries. <laughs> so we had to skip school today. Um, <laughs> so let me see. I know I was, um, that he had a recurrent, um, he was healthy the first year and I didn't notice any mouth breathing, but exactly like at one year old, he started having more infections, always like um, sinus infections, not that many ear infections, and he was a, like, a heavy snorer. He used to fall asleep all the time and uh, very irritable. Also, at, during sleep time, like he would hold his breath. I would count it for like sometimes 60 seconds. And I would just like, move him just because I was so scared. And finally, we decided to take him to an ENT. And uh, before doing the surgery, the tonsillectomy and the adenoidectomy, they wanted to do a sleep study because he was so young. And that's the only thing that helped us have him diagnosed because if they would have said like, oh, just uh, let's do the surgery, I would have been fine with it without knowing anything else because I had no information about this. So they did the sleep study and he showed severe obstructive sleep apnea. I think he had uh, like a 60 or somewhere up there episodes. Um, his AHI was 60. Then we did the surgery and uh, he 
the tonsils were so big and the adenoids too that the surgeon at the moment he was like oh we don't need to do the other procedure that he wanted to do because he was sure that that was it so then they did repeat the sleep study three months after just to make sure and he was still high like he was still severe because he still has around 25 29 so since then since he was, since he turned, because that whole thing lasted for, since we knew that he had severe obstructive sleep apnea and the surgery and getting the CPAP, that whole, that whole thing lasted about like six to like nine months, perhaps. So since he's three, he started using um, a CPAP and uh, we've had uh, about three providers in different states. And besides just going for a sleep study yearly, and uh, the first one, I think we kept the same mask for a whole year. I really didn't have much information. I asked like, okay, so what's going to be the outcome? Like, what are we going to do after? Like, can he, can, is he going to have to wear it uh, forever? And they're like, well, hopefully he outgrows it, but his body is supposed to like outgrow it somehow. But uh, that we ne I, it just didn't like seem okay to me because like he has the mask for like 10 hours a night. So I don't know how he could have. And then I started like, we started like doing our own research and finally found like a myofunctional therapy, different masks, trying to do as much as we can. Uh, uh, right now he has, uh, just last week, we put in uh, two expanders, upper and lower and uh, to hopefully like increase his airway, like his palate and then his airway. And uh, he already, because when we, I'm backtracking, when we moved to Florida, um, he had, um, they did have information about a palate, like they said like a palate expander would benefit, but there were, there are no providers in my area and somebody was willing to do something. So we tried one expander for 17 months, which really didn't do anything because it wasn't the appropriate one for a basically three-year-old at that time. So it actually like hindered his um, speech and the tongue posture, which is detrimental in this uh, condition. Um, so now we're, trying to correct that and I feel like we lost time but at least at least we know about it and we're doing what we can right now and let's see what happens so he's a very um, resilient child and um, he he I show him videos like to other of other kids like wearing CPAPs and stuff like that and uh, prices and that's what we do Mm -hmm. But he sleeps definitely better. Without it, we had a sleep study last year and it was still like in the 20s. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. And um, he does need to have his adenoids removed I don't, I, because they grew back. And um, so we're waiting to expand the airway and uh, possibly a tongue tie later on once there's room in his mouth. And uh, then we'll do the adenoidectomy. So to see how that goes, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's a journey. It's a long, like finding yeah. night, like nights that I'm doing research online because there's information. It's really hard to find. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, and and uh, Dr. Honecker can talk a little bit about this, but it's you know, it it the the conversation is is more up and coming. I'm sure you know if we, you know, go to Michelle and she thinks back when you know her parents were trying to help her and figure out and work with her doctors, it's a totally different situation than what you're dealing with, Margarita, because you know you are able to find some resources. There is some stuff there online. There's a lot of medical doctors and researchers, you know, like, like uh, Dr. Honecker we have here that are, you know, pushing some information out there and, and, and helping families because, you know, while it is a, uh, like you're saying, a long journey for a small child, you know, the, the benefits of, of taking those steps and putting in the effort now is so great that when they are older, 
you know, it, it will be better for them. You know, I mean, people, you know, people may have know, know that, you know, I've talked with Dr. Honecker in the past. We're both uh, parents of, of uh, OSA children as well. So all of us, you know, here, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, are a cut of that same cloth. And, you know, my daughter had to wear a mask and, uh, you know, bring up the slide so, slideshow. Um, so Dr. Honecker can share a little bit of her experience. But that, that is another reason, you know, for having this discussion is to get the other information out there, to get things, um, you know, to start to have the, the, the talks and figure out where the information is and what you're trying. And because it is not, it also is not a, you know, one size fits all. What, what Margarita is doing in her journey might have been different than when Michelle kind of had to do a little bit, you know, when she was younger. It, you know, they're very similar, but there's always, you know, something, something different. So, um, Dr. Sarah, can I go ahead and share the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. 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 So thank you so much for having me today. And um, thank you, Michelle and Margarita, for sharing your stories. Um, so I'm, I'm here, in a sense, in a dual role. So as a parent of a child who had OSA and, um, and then also an OSA researcher. Um, so this, um, you can see the little, the little one um, wrapped up in all the wires is my daughter, Kate. And when she was about 15 months old, um, I started to notice that she was making some unusual noises during sleep. She would seem to stop breathing and then have what we call recovery breathing. So there would be a pause and then very quick breathing or some unusual noises. Uh, and at the time that I was noticing this, I was doing a postdoctoral fellowship in a research lab that studied sleep apnea. Um, and so it was very much on my, on my mind. Um, and I thought that that might be what was happening with Kate, um, but it was, um, oh, one of the things that was a little bit tricky was that it, it wasn't snoring. Um, and that's, uh, I think it sometimes can be a misperception that um, oftentimes children with sleep apnea will snore, um, but in some cases and particularly in the little ones, it, it's not really snoring. It's more of just a noisy, um, irregular breathing. Um, so I was noticing that with Kate. Um, so I, we went ahead I, and I took a video to her pediatrician um, who immediately said, oh yeah, she just stopped breathing. Um, and and that is, that's a strategy that I um, really do encourage parents to consider is get a, get a video of what you're seeing that's um, alarming um, because it's, um, it just makes it um, more clear, I think, to, to the PCP and it's, um, it, it's easier to, for them to, um, to see that this is maybe not normal. Um, so then um, Kate had a sleep study. It was a very difficult night, um, but we got it done. Um, and um, her apnea hypopnea index was about a 17, um, which is high for, high for a little one. Um, and so we um, saw an ENT fairly quickly and um, she had her tonsils and adenoids removed, both of which were large. Um, and then she had a, she stayed overnight in the hospital because of her age. Um, and then she had a follow-up study about six weeks later. She already sounded quite a bit better to us, but we wanted to have that next, that follow-up study to be sure and her apnea hypopnea index was less than one. Um, so this was a situation we were really lucky to find the sleep apnea early to get um, high quality treatment in a, in a timely manner. And um, we were also very fortunate that in her case, it really was the tonsils and the adenoids. Um, so, um, yeah, so we were able to um, get that treated. Now, when she was around five or six, I started noticing some snoring and we had another study just to make sure because kids who have had sleep apnea are at, you know, at higher risk to have it again. 
or to have it recur, um, you know, oftentimes there are things about maybe their facial structure that make them a little bit more prone to sleep apnea. Um, but Kate um, did not, her study was normal when she was around five or six. And um, there she is, you can see her on the right um, at, uh, I think she was 11 in that picture, but she is now 12 and um, she's, she's doing great. I think it's really important if I if I could just, you know, interject the one thing that you said and, and Margarita did this with her son. And I mean, is that to take that second step with the sleep study of after the treatment that you do, you know, so, you know, you have the tonsils and adenoids taken out and then, you know, kind of see how is it now, you know, to take that temperature check because, you know, um, for, you know, like as Margarita said, it, it changed a little bit, but not that much. Whereas for your daughter, you know, she was able to, you know, reach that threshold where it was, okay, you know, we've, you know, solved the problem uh, for, for now, let's just keep an eye on it, you know, with, and then with Margarita's son, um, you know, there's, there was still some more intervention. That was what happened with my daughter. Um, you know, it dropped, it went from, you know, 27 to 12 or something along those lines of cut, cut in half with her tonsils and adenoids, but that was still too high, the 12. And so she, you know, she wore a CPAP machine. So I think it's very important to make sure that that's part of your journey and protocol that you follow. And yeah, and I think too, um, I think sometimes parents after a surgery might fear their child and think, oh, it is so much better um, because oftentimes it is. Um, but the, the threshold for a child who has already had a, an OSA diagnosis who has a surgery, the threshold for getting another sleep study should be any snoring or any noisy breathing. So it's not just that it should be better, but um, it should essentially be gone. Um, and if, if it is gone, then, then guidelines say there's no need to repeat the sleep study. Um, but if the child still snores, um, that is enough um, to um, meet criteria to, to get a second study, just to make sure that it's gone. And we also know that there are certain kids who are more likely to have residual sleep apnea. So children who have a higher apnea hypopnea index to begin with. So in uh, Margarita's case, um, the um, the uh, 60, um, and that's really high. And so, and it got quite a bit better, but the higher it is to begin with, the more likely it is to be um, residual. And, um, and then also there are certain groups, so African-American children, for example, are more likely to have residual RSA. So there are other risk factors and children who are, um, are overweight are also more likely to have residual sleep apnea after uh, surgery. So those are just um, some, some things to be aware of. I have a question here from Nick who asks if Nocturia was also present with your daughter. So with my daughter, she was um, 18 months or 15 months. And so um, she, she wasn't at an age where that would have been on her radar yet because she wasn't mm -hmm. trained. Um, but um, Nocturia is considered, or, or nocturnal enuresis, bedwetting, I mean, that is considered a, a symptom of sleep apnea. Um, it can be caused by other things as well, but um, it can be a symptom of sleep apnea that goes away after treatment. Any experience with that, Margarita or Michelle? No. My son was young too. And uh, the one thing that they did ask me if, if he had, um, if he sweats a lot yeah. at night. And I remember, I'm like, oh, is that correlated? Because he used to drench his clothes from sweat. So they were, he used to sweat like he, all the time. And I was just like, oh, he's just like warm, I guess. And, um, the other thing that was difficult for me to pinpoint is because at the same time, like six months after he was diagnosed with type one diabetes. So, and one of the symptoms is that like urination. Like, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but the sweating part was there. Definitely. Yeah. Michelle, did you, are you shaking your head? Yes. That was with, with you too, or you're just agreeing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 
I pulled up your next slide, Dr. Honecker, if you wanted to just let me know when you're ready to move forward with them, I'll do that. Yeah, so um, one of the ways and that parents can really sort of equip themselves and, and learn more is to look at the guidelines um, for sleep apnea. So this is this was published in um, 2012, I believe, and it, uh, it's, I think it's the most recent guideline um, certainly the most recent from the American Academy of Pediatrics on um, diagnosis and management of pediatric OSA. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind moving to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, the oh, next here, slide. let me go. I think they might have got out of order. Is this okay. it? Uh, yeah. Next one. Next one. <laughs> the next one. Oh, I'm still yeah. going. That's okay. This one. Oh, I think there's one that's missing. Well, it's okay. I'll just review the, I'll just, I, I, I can just review what's in the guidelines. So just a couple of sort of important points that are in that guideline statement. Um, the first is that every child should be screened for snoring, meaning that that should be a standard question that is being asked in, at the primary, in the primary care setting. Um, and because a lot of times parents aren't necessarily bringing that up because they don't know that it might be a symptom of sleep apnea. So that should be happening from the primary care provider standpoint. If a child snores and has any one of these symptoms on the slide, so if they snore and have labored breathing, if they snore and have sleep enuresis, so that would, usually that they'd have to be at least six for bedwetting to be considered enuresis. Um, if they snore and have daytime sleepiness, if they snore and have an ADHD diagnosis, if they snore and have an unhealthy weight, um, any of those, um, and sometimes uh, it's referred to as snoring plus one, that would be sufficient for um, further evaluation for OSA. Um, and um, in terms of what that next referral or evaluation would be, that um, there's some leeway there. So the, the recommendation with the most evidence is that children should have a sleep study, um, but it's also considered evidence-based for a child to go straight to ENT for evaluation or to see a sleep medicine specialist who would probably order a sleep study. <laughs> but um, yeah, so those are sort of what the guidelines say. And the other thing the guidelines say is that, um, and we already talked about this a little bit, is that children who snore after treatment, uh, or the children should be assessed following treatment, so after surgery, and if they, they still snore, then a repeat sleep study would be warranted. Um, I yeah. know, you know, for my daughter, she would sleep in um, child's pose, you know, kind of like in that triangle where her, you know, a uh, uh, bum was up in the air and, you know, she was, her face was down, so she was sleeping like this. And, um, uh, my my husband who has severe OSA, I was talking with you know his doctor, his sleep doctor about it. Uh, happened to be Dr. Christian Gimeno, and you know he said, well, you know your daughter has it has it too. You know she's sleeping like that, so everything falls forward and isn't blocking her airway. You know her tongue's not falling back, everything, and uh, and so you know it's it's interesting to see the the sleeping position there. What is the what is the uh, I, am I saying it right? Cyanosis is that what I, is that the the one underneath it? Yeah, cyanosis. So that is um, turning blue from not getting enough. Um, okay. Breath. So that can be caused by things other than um, sleep apnea. That's pretty rare, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, that seems like with like small babies sometimes, you know, like when they're crying, you know how it is when they're crying so much or I Margarita said when her son would get mad and hold his breath, I'm sure, unfortunately. He did turn like blue yeah. so, and passed out. That is, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so can we, I'm sorry, they got a little out of order. Can we talk about this? Because this is, this is a great summary of, of what we just saw. Yeah, so um, one of the things that, I mean, my, my research really is focused on finding kids who have sleep apnea while they're still young, um, and because we do know how to treat it in, in a lot of cases. It's not always simple, right, with Margarita's son, and it's kind of a journey, but we, we do have treatments that work, um, but we have to find these kids, and um, so our goal is um, we've, we've worked a lot with the pediatricians in the past where we have 
um, given them notice notifications in the medical record to say, hey, this child, the parent reported that this child snores, you should evaluate them for sleep apnea. Um, but what, what we're testing now is, um, in addition to that, what happens if we give the parent some information when the child screens positive for sleep apnea. So in the waiting room, we're at, you know, the, the goal is to ask parents, does your child snore? Um, and if they say yes, we'll ask a handful of additional questions. And if they endorse any of those, then, then they would see this, um, then they would see this visual. Um, and the idea is that, um, that there's a connection between what you're seeing, what you might be seeing at night and what you might be seeing during the day. Um, and so in children with sleep apnea, these problems at night, so snoring or noisy breathing. Um, oh, um, this is, uh, okay, so this is an older version, but we, so we changed it to restless sleep. And then the last one, we, we originally had not getting enough oxygen for your brain, but parents told us that that was a little bit um, scary. Um, and so we changed that to um, waking during the night. Um, that if you're seeing these things, that they, these things can cause problems during the day. And if, if you see any of these problems, nighttime or daytime, let your child know. No. So that the um, so that the detection, like this process is starting not just on the, on the side of the um, primary care provider, but also the, that it can be parent initiated. Yeah. Um, Michelle, are you comfortable talking a little bit about, you know, kind of, I know you and your mom were on the journey together uh, when you were younger, trying to figure out how you were feeling and, and, and what was going on. Would something like this have been helpful for her? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, I have a, a vague memory, but my mom does not, of a sleep study being um, mentioned to do. Um, and I remember it because of how terrifying it sounded and um, how we didn't know. I don't think we were ever, I don't think it was ever said to go to an ENT besides for the tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy, um, because I remember thinking to myself, there's nothing wrong with my heart, so I'm not getting a sleep study. So I think pulmonology, cardiology, I think that all kind of got mixed together for us, um, or for me, and uh, also the anxiety of the fact that I struggled to sleep in my own bed and struggled even more in hotel rooms when I was going to swim meets. Like, I mean, it was a huge deal for me to try to sleep away from home. So the imagining going to a doctor's office, a clinic and being hooked up and everything was um, out of the question at the time. But I think if we had more evidence that we were able to see, you know, or understand that my symptoms were lining up with something like that, that would have helped me like be like, I need to do this. You know, you need to be strong. You need to do what, you know, the doctors are telling you to do. But we were really, we were really lost. And uh, again, I was born in 1992. So we didn't have all the research or the access and understanding of the research now. We didn't have like social media to uh, be able to go online and say like, oh, my doctor is suggesting this for my child. I don't know anything about it. Please help me. Like we, we didn't really have any of that. So um, anything to make it kind of easier and less scary and also um, to feel understood is, uh, can only help the process for, for others. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, you know, if for, for uh, older children, you know, even, you know, nine, 10, getting into that area, you know, being able to um, feel that this isn't something that's just happening to them, you know what I mean, yes. or something along those lines, that's really important, because it, you know, like it said, I mean, they, they have anxiety, just like the rest of us do about daily things in life and doing new things. And, you know, and they're getting to that age where it's, it's important for them to see their peers doing those things or, or having it. And so, um, you know, and, and yes, I mean, ha getting a sleep study on a small child is, you know, one journey that Margarita and, and Dr. Honecker and myself experienced, you know, with our kids, it's, yeah, that's one thing. And, you know, it's, it's going to be slightly different, but yet still similar if they're 10 or 12 or something, because it's, it's, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot, you're sleeping out, like you're saying, there's a lot of 
little wires and all that thing right here that is a candela. Am I saying it right? Uh, it, that, yeah. yeah, that one's the bad one <laughs> for kids. It's like they could take anything else. You want to say something, Margarita? Uh, oh, was that the wire? Because it yeah. was like a wire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that was that's the one that gets gets I think probably gets most people, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, There's sometimes a misperception that your child at a sleep study um, needs to sleep how they do at home. And some parents think, well, they're not going to they're not going to sleep well. And um, that's actually OK, because the, if, if they sleep at all, obviously they have to fall asleep at some point. Um, in order to, to, to be able to die, you know, to see how they breathe while they're asleep, but it doesn't have to be like at home. Um, it, or it doesn't have to feel like it is at home. Um, they can take longer to fall asleep. They can wake up more, um, but their breathing on the, on the night of the study when they finally do sleep is probably going to be similar to how they breathe at home. And so even if it's a difficult night, even if you're thinking, how did they get anything out of that? They like, they didn't even sleep. A lot of times they did sleep, you know, more than you think, and they were able to get what they needed. So it doesn't have to be a representative night. It doesn't have to be a great night. They just need some sleep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's important to point out for, for children as well as adults, because I think adults tell themselves the same thing. You know, if, if they, you know, at 40 some years old or 50, so I'm never going to sleep well there. They're not going to be able to tell anything. Uh, it's not going to, you know, it's not going to show anything because I'm not sleeping like I am at home. That's, that's a really, really good point. It's just those couple cycles that you do get through because you actually do fall asleep for a while, even though you may not feel it. Um, they're the doctors and 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 uh, they're able to to able to do that. Um, I do want to start to talk a little bit about um, some um, interventions uh, that are a little bit different for dealing with pediatrics than are available to adults. You know, most of us know with adults, the gold standard is a CPAP machine, uh, which a lot in our community utilize. There are up and coming um, interventions like Michelle has uh, with implants, so on and so forth, that are being starting to, you know, gain traction and be made available for individuals. There's appliances that adults use. Um, but there are also things in regards with, with children that um, you can start on the journey to hopefully, when they're older, them not have a, 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 as many repercussions with OSA as if you didn't treat it. So, you know, Margarita was talking about uh, myofunctional therapy. Um, Dr. Honecker, can you tell us a little bit about what that is, just in a nutshell? I'm actually going to defer to Margarita on that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm not an MD. I'm a PhD okay. speaker, and I don't. Uh, I know we use it in our center, and I know it's like sort of training the airway um, to yeah. strengthening the airway, but yeah. that's about all I got. So I'll give a little bit and then I'll turn it over to Margarita. So um, myofunctional therapy is um, where you're working with the muscles of the tongue and the mouth in order to help um, kind of, you know, tone them, shape them, help with the shape of the mouth. Because, you know, one of the important things is, is you're supposed to breathe through your nose and you're supposed to talk and eat with your mouth. So if mouth breathing is a, is a, is a, um, an indicator also a little bit of, of, a, what do I want to say? A sleep disordered sleep, you know, when you're sleeping, breathing issue. And so, you know, when you're just relaxing, like, you know, Here's the four of us here. I'm the one that's talking. You know, is your tongue on the roof of your mouth? Just you're like in a relaxed setting. Your tongue should be on the roof of your mouth. That helps to widen your palate as you grow because you're placing your tongue there. Because if you think about it, your mouth and your nose are, are a triangle. It's all connected, right? The top of your mouth and your nose. So if you're making that part wider, you're making your nose bigger for more air to 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 enter and, and to go in. So, you know, there's a lot of exercises and I'll let Margarita talk about what she does with with her son and, and his therapist. So basically what you said to strengthen that to prevent uh, mouth breathing, which is very hard because as of now, like if he's been mouth, if a, I feel like if a kid has been mouth breathing since they're babies and then um so the the palate is really high the arch 
so it's really difficult for there's no room for them to keep the tongue up there and uh, so we do a lot of exercises and that's the hardest part of it all and um so yeah we work with a multifunctional therapist can you it, tell us like one or two exercises like what they're like like um, do you do the button with the string we Does do, he do the that button. yeah he's actually really str he has a strong like he has strong lips now and uh strong uh, you mouth can put because the but to put the string here and you have to like, it has a button at the end of it, a big one, a really big he one. Has and you have to like bring it up with your now. lips to yeah, strengthen your the, lips. <laughs> like a spaghetti, uh -huh. they have yeah. to like suck it up. And then another one that they pull the button and that's just like one week. So then we go like also like correcting posture. So there's like several, we're working with one for like, for we're going to be working with her for one year. And she'll also help us once we get the tongue tie released. And I was going to say too, that I didn't know this because we also work with another occupational therapist back in the day when my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes because he was a very picky eater. And that was another thing because his tongue couldn't reach the roof of his mouth then um, anything that got stuck there, he wouldn't like it. So he would only eat like three things. And the reason was because his mouth was weak not because he didn't like something. So it was like too much work for him to do. So now that we're working, we've been working with her for about three, four months, maybe less. It's, he's trying so many more things. It's just amazing, like one little thing, what he can do, like one change because it, it's getting stronger. So it's amazing. <laughs> That's great to hear. That's great yeah. to hear. Yeah. And uh, one of the other exercises was like, it was like a little plastic spoon you had to hold in your lips and then you put little weights on the end. So you had to really purse your lips together and make them strong, you know, so the spoon just didn't flop down. So it's just strengthening all of those uh, mm -hmm. facial muscles. The facial masseter. Yeah. Like yeah. the, the tongue and the mastication and so it's yeah. uh so we get used to breathing to keep the tongue on the spot and to breathe to breathe through our noses. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so your myofunctional therapy is definitely um, something in regards with with children that really can, you know, can make a difference because what you're doing is, you know, they're they're Fa uh, facial uh, bones, muscles, like, you know, uh, are, are more pliable. They're not set, you know, you know, just like it's easier a little bit with braces and some things when you're younger than versus an adult, um, uh, because it's a little more pliable since they're so young. So you're able to kind of take the shape that it's in and make it bigger. Another thing, uh, you know, Margarita's looked at, we did with our daughter was um, various types of expanders. There are expanders that go kind of on the back of the molars that push the teeth, you know, out and, and kind of, you know, widen that perspective. And there's also um, up and coming more expanders that are actually, um, it sounds a little bit more intense than it, than it is. It's, it's, it's really not. My, my daughter had it as actually as well as my husband. It's um, where they put the implanter, they just kind of put it in the actual roof of your mouth, not onto your teeth, but, you know, like up here. And then you just crank it like you would the normal expander. And it's pushing apart that suture that's on the top of your mouth. And when you're young, uh, it's still pliable. It hasn't solidified yet, like with an adult. And what that does, as I, you know, said before, is it's opening your, your nasal cavity, actually. It's pushing. And my daughter... Maybe you could see I have a gap between my teeth. <laughs> when my daughter had hers and it opens it, she got a gap just like me for a little while. And then what's amazing is, you know, your teeth are always moving. I always forget that. Her teeth, I thought we were going to have to get a few braces just for cosmetic. Her teeth just morphed back together afterwards. And now we don't need any braces. So, you know, that was an extra cosmetic bonus that, that came with that. But yeah, because it actually split you know, this, that suture up there made her, and since then, she hasn't been using a CPAP machine, and her sleep has been, has, has been good. She's 13 now, so, mm -hmm. you know, doing these, these interventions, you know, I, you know, no one, no one can guarantee what's going to happen as, you know, a child gets older, but at least it gives you a little bit longer of a runway, you know, just as Dr. Honecker, Honecker said that, you know, if you're predisposed for because of facial features and, you know, OSA runs in your family, um, you know, 
your son might have to wear a CPAP again, a machine again, maybe he's 40 or 50, but it's better than having to wear it, you know, all now, all throughout all those years. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's important to, to, to look into those things. And, um, you know, Margarita and I were talking about um, American Sleep Apnea Association had a great relationship with Dr. Christian Gimeno, uh, who passed away Oh, maybe two or three years now. Um, and he was a big proponent of early identification of uh, OSA in, in children and early interventions, particularly myofunctional therapy and, um, you know, working with those more of the expander that kind of gets implanted versus on the teeth to try to, you know, help with because, um, you know, getting them to breathe correctly and more oxygen while they're developing when they're young is helping their brain, just like you kind of had on that slide before, um, where you were talking about getting oxygen to the brain. They're in their developmental years, so it's really important. Teresa, do we have any questions from the from the participants? Yes, we do. Um, I this was posted when you all were talking about sleep studies. And Nick asked, what about a home sleep study? Would that have been beneficial for, you know, anybody to answer? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No. <laughs> I, I was going to say that um, I think that I know that um, home sleep studies are used much more frequently in adults. Um, right now, I think that's not the norm with children. Um, I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I, I, some of it, children move around more than adults, so they're more likely to lose pieces or to dislodge pieces. And um, I also think the science and the technology um, isn't quite there yet in terms of um, home sleep studies for children, um, but hopefully we'll learn more about which children um, it could, you know, it would be appropriate for, and um, hopefully those will be more widely available because it just makes it easier to uh, to get the study done when, in a lot of cases. Did you have an experience, Margarita, with it? No, that I tried for my son to get one at home, but they, I still wouldn't because he's too little, uh, he, like mostly for adults. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Teresa, yeah. next question. Oh. oh, go ahead, go ahead, Michelle. Oh. I've just, I've had two home sleep studies as an adult and they both showed that I did not have sleep apnea. So I don't, um, I thought the first one was kind of a fluke, but then a couple of years later I needed another one and uh, for insurance purposes. And it still said I had no sleep apnea and then I had to go to the clinic anyway and I have and sleep apnea. And so. the <laughs> clinic said you did, okay, yeah. 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 So, so. Um, but I know other people are successful with it. Again, as an adult, I can see that being very difficult um, for a parent to have to um, monitor their kid and try to try to get them to cooperate at home. I feel like, I mean, I'm not sure, but I can see a kid being a little bit more cooperative in a clinic um, because they have no choice, so. <laughs> Yeah. And you have backup. You have the nurse and all the nurses. Yes, backup. To, mm -hmm. to, Absolutely. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Teresa, do we have any more questions? No, we, we are finished with the questions. Okay. Okay. Well, is there any parting words? Let's, let's, let, oh, uh, yeah, let's go around and just do any parting words for, you know, the discussion today. Um, Margarita, we'll go ahead and kick it off with you. Maybe you can offer um, some advice maybe for those, since you have a young patient now, uh, that, you know, son that you're, that you're working with, just words of advice from, you know, one parent to another. Um, to try to do the most that we can uh, for them if they really need it, to use the CPAP, because I can see the difference in my son. If one day, like we have a hard time using the CPAP, the next day is horrible because he's like falling asleep. He has dark circles under his eyes. So he, even though it's not the optimal like thing so he can go to sleep with, but he definitely needs it. And uh, hopefully one day they start making like better pediatric masks so they don't interfere with the, with the growth of the, of the face, the facial bones. Um, other than that, it's just like encourage them and do as we can. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an important topic because, uh, or just thing I just want to touch on because we had that discussion in my family too about our daughter being four and wearing this big mask that you know is just pressing on their little tiny face all night long, and you kind of worry a little bit about that, especially because their noses are so little and that little bridge right there. But um, you know, because we went along and, and, you know, looked at other interventions, it was the, the CPAP that she used was a little bit of a stopgap for a while, especially with the full face mask, because then we started with the expansion and this and that. Then she just had a little nasal mask for a while, because then her mouth was shut when she was sleeping. So then she could do, she wore the nasal mask just for another couple of years um, until we had the uh, the other type of expander. And so I think that that's important. I, it, I think it's a worry for a lot of parents out there, you know, the thought of that pressure and that mask on their, on their child. But, um, you know, if, if you, if you continue on the journey and you implement those other interventions, it will just be for, for a, a shorter period, hopefully, and you could try a different type of mask, you know, and hopefully they'll, they'll grow a little bit and then they can use adult sizes, smalls and petites and things like that. Um, and so, you know, but the, getting that oxygen to their brain, you know, having them have good days and mornings versus struggling, like you're saying, when he doesn't wear it, those, you know, uh, seem to outweigh, outweigh that, you know, wearing the mask all night. So, yeah. And Michelle, what about you in regards to, you know, now that, you know, you're, you're an adult and, and, and looking back and, you know, giving some, some um, words of wisdom to parents, uh, <laughs> you know, since you, can reflect on it now that you're uh, a little bit older. Yes, um, I, I love the um, idea of, you know, a die or a screening with, uh, you know, snoring plus one. <laughs> I just, that's amazing. I think that's um, a brilliant uh, tool for, uh, you know, the family doctor, the pediatricians to utilize. Uh, I think it should also be um, asked if anybody in the family has been diagnosed with sleep apnea, even if they were, you know, like we said, 40, 50, 60, when they were diagnosed, it still could be something that is a structural thing that's going through the families um, that that we don't necessarily think about automatically. So um, that's, I think, it for me. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, you raised that point. That's a really, really good one that it does have a tendency to run in families. Um, You know, that's exactly what my husband's doctor told me about my daughter when we were all there together, you know, at one of his appointments, you know, when we were talking about how she was sleeping in that child's pose position. And he's like, well, you know, she has it too. And I'm like, holy cow, she's a little tiny too. But, but yep, yep, she did. Um, Dr. Sarah, uh, where can, I know that you provided the, um, the guidelines paper yeah. that individuals uh, can, can, can research and take a look at and, and, and that other slide that has some of the things listed. What about the graphic that, that, that we had up? Can, can um, you know, attendees here access the, the, the visual screener somewhere? Um, not yet, but not yet. it sounds like it's um, at some point, because uh, we're still working on, on tweaking it, but at some point it will, it will, the plan is for it to be available on the um, AFAA website, so um, you can access it there. Um, the guidelines paper is free, not all research articles are, but you can Google AAP guidelines for pediatric OSA and it, it should take you there. Um, I also just want you know, to say to Michelle, I'm it's, I'm so sorry for everything that you went through, and it sounds like you and your mom were were doing the right things. You were aware, you were concerned, you were talking to people about it. Um, and um, sometimes it just you do the right things, and um, maybe the science isn't advanced, the awareness isn't there. Um, but um, so I guess my parting words would also be to to the to the attendees just to spread the word, you know, let people know that pediatric OSA is, is out there that, um, and that it's not normal for children to snore, um, that it's something that, that should be looked into. Um, and then if you are going to, if, if you do talk to a provider about it and um, you feel like it's maybe not being taken seriously, then um, I would um, look at the guidelines, um, you know, get a video and try again. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it, it, it is also finding a different provider. Um, you know, my daughter's pediatrician didn't really agree with the, the, that we needed to do a sleep study and, you know, it probably didn't really, you know, wasn't going to really show anything and really wasn't necessary and lo and behold it was. And while it is a little bit of a daunting night, it does give you information, information to continue on, on the journey, whether it is or whether it isn't. So, you know, then you at least have another piece of information on what's happening with your child and, you know, can formulate the next steps from there. So, um, um, great. Well, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us today and, and sharing your stories, sharing your personal stories, Michelle and Margarita, sharing your personal story, Dr. Honecker, with your daughter and, and what you went through, and then also sharing your research and your information with us, which is, which is really great and useful. And I, and I do think that your point of um, everyone sharing as much information as they can, you know, um, you know, Michelle coming on now and talking about, you know, what it was like, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and how it's different, a little different from Margarita, because she's able to find the information online, you know, we have a Facebook group uh, with sleepapnea.org, we have an online forum. Um, so there is uh, resources and people to connect with in all types of places for you to ask questions and and start your 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 research to to help you and your child get ready for for that journey because um, you know we all want uh, we all want the best for our kids and want them to grow up happy and healthy and and try to mitigate everything that we can uh, from the start and getting good sleep and breathing correctly is a uh, some of the most important things that will set you up on that other course, for sure. So I also uh, just want to put this up here really quick and say thank you to um, some of our supporters here who uh, supplied us with unrestricted educational grants that make summit to make today's summits and the summit this week happen like Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Fisher and PayCal Healthcare and Takeda. So thank you to them for, for their support for us to help get all this educational material out. So that's it, ladies. Thank you so much for, for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll see some of you back in the audience tomorrow uh, when we talk with um, Dr. Michael Grandner in regards to insomnia, fatigue, and sleep apnea. So thank you, everybody. Have a good day today. Thanks for your time. Bye. Bye.